flow and radial transport. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, so uh, my name is Cameron Trapp. I'm a, a PhD student uh, down at UCSD working with uh, Dushan Koresh. I'm going to talk to you about a uh, paper that uh, got published uh, at the start of this year where we were looking at uh, gas inflows onto disks and transport radially through the disks themselves, um, specifically in the, those cosmic ray simulations uh, that Dushan mentioned. Um, so just to give you a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to just start with a quick overview of um, the problem we, we looked at and then give just a quick reminder of the, the actual cosmic ray simulation suite that we were using and then kind of get into the meat and potatoes um, and introduce you to the galaxies uh, we were working on and go through kind of what the angular momentum looks like, what the radio, radial and vertical velocities and mass fluxes look like, and then the specific geometry of how the gas is actually joining onto the disk and how it's able to move through the disk to fuel um, star formation in more interior regions. Um, and if I have time at the end, I'm going to just draw some quick comparisons um, to the other FIRE2 simulations without cosmic rays and discuss some of the observational implications uh, this work might have in the future directions those are going to take us. Okay, so, so just, just a quick over, overview. Um, as has been mentioned before at this conference, um, previous studies have shown that the galactic star formation is lar largely supply driven. That is, you're accreting a certain amount of gas and you're uh, you know, forming roughly that many stars. Um, but they, they tend to uh, focus on the overall picture, so the overall gas inflow, um, while we're going to be more focused on specifically how it is joining the disk, where it's joining the disk, and how it's actually getting to these star forming regions uh, within the disk. Right? So uh, previous simulation studies have shown that this gas is, uh, can lar be largely coat rotating and tends to have uh, fairly high angular momentum in the halo. Um, which implies that it, it may be a reasonable assumption to think that it's going to be um, settling into co-rotation at the disk outskirts, so near the edge of the disks. Um, it's unclear exactly where this ends up settling. And for those of you who haven't gotten bored with it and are still keeping count, here's this figure. Um, so I just want to uh, emphasize we're mostly going to be focused on this region here where this accreting gas is coming in. So where is it exactly is it joining onto the disk, right? Is it joining near the edge and then radially transporting inwards? Or is it um, kind of more directly fueling the star formation by raining down more vertically? Or is it somewhere in the middle and more complicated like galaxies always are? Right, so just a quick reminder, Dushan gave a, gave a good overview, so I won't go into this in too much detail, but we're using uh, the implementation of cosmic ray transport by T.K. Chan back in 2019 and its uh, uh, extension to the full cosmological suite of simulations. Um, and the, the most important takeaway for, for this study is that uh, the cosmic rays provide that non-thermal pressure support that Dushan mentioned, which essentially is limiting the amount of inflow we're getting from the CGM. Um, this additionally limits the uh, radial transport through the disk and limits the star formation rate in the disk, um, bringing it down from you know, around 5 to 10 solar masses down to 2 to 4 solar masses. So the disks are a little bit more stable and have star formation rates a little bit closer to what we expect for Milky Way-like disks. Wrong way? Okay. So let's get into the, the actual um, study itself. Uh, so these are the four main galaxies uh, we focused on. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction, we have M12M here on the left. Uh, this is a fairly large disk, so it's a little abnormally large compared to the other ones. It's about 30 kiloparsecs in radius. Um, and we have M12I, which is a, a bit smaller, a bit closer to what we would expect for like a Milky Way, for instance. Um, it's about 17 kiloparsecs. Then M12F, just very important um, because it, it influences a couple of the quantitative results, but it underwent a recent merger at about redshift 0.1. So that kind of stream uh, accretion of accretion you see in the top left corner is actually it finishing up eating an LMC mass uh, object. And finally, M12B on the right is much more compact than the other disks. So it's a little less built up, which also affects some of the geometry of how um, things are accreting. And so one thing I want to point out as just a general rule uh, for these disks is they tend to have fairly, um, fairly sharp gaseous edges. 
So the, the hydrogen and the H1 column density tends to drop off by you know, several orders of magnitude within a kiloparsec or less at the disk edge. So it's very easy for us to go in and kind of label uh, what we're talking about as the edge of the gaseous disk, um, which you can see in the white lines there. Um, I'm, I'll refer to this occasionally as RDLA. It's, it's just the radius at which the total hydrogen column density drops below 10 to the 20.3. Um, okay, so what does this look like and what do these disks look like in angular momentum? Um, so here on the top, uh, we just have the specific angular momentum for these four disks. Um, the red dashed line is just what the uh, specific angular momentum would look like solely predicted from the enclosed mass. Um, so just, you know, essentially based on the rotation curve. Well, the, the thick black line corresponds to the actual specific mass weighted average specific angular momentum of the gas particles in the disk. And so a key feature you see, uh, I guess I should point out the x-axis here is the radius of the disk normalized by that uh, previously mentioned RDLA. So a value of one um, corresponds to the disk edge. This just allows us to all can, you know, compare them on roughly the same scale, even though the disks are uh, different sizes. So key thing you notice within the disk, the, the gas tends to be, you know, very, very well aligned with the ro rotation you expect um, from the, the rotation curve. And then once you get outside the disk, uh, the rotation is still increasing, or it's still higher than the disk edge, but it's no longer being fully rotationally supported, right? which makes sense because we're expecting gaseous infalls. I'm um, looking here at the, the bottom row of the plots. Um, this is just characterizing how well aligned the gas's rotation is with the disk. So just the, the Z component of the specific angular momentum, which is the component aligned with disk rotation normalized by the total value. And again, we see a transition at the disk edge where gas within the disk is you know, very well aligned because it's a well-behaved uh, disk. And once you go outside the disk edge, it begins to drop off. Um, uh, just note the scale of these y-axes. Uh, and even in the uh, high end of the radius regime we're looking at, it's still fairly well aligned with the disk. It's still you know, about 80% coherence. Um, so it still tends to be co-rotating. Yeah, so that was, this is just the, essentially the, what we're quantifying as the edge of the gaseous disk. All right, so it's, it's just uh, giving a metric for how big the gas disk is. Yeah, yeah, so we, we based it just off the column density. Okay, um, so looking at this in radial velocities. Um, so before I, before I dive into this, I just wanna make it clear what the positive and negative and the different colors mean. Uh, so um, in the face plots, blue values or uh, negative radial velocities correspond to uh, radial gas inflow with respect to the galactic center, um, while the red values uh, or the positive values correspond to outflow radial outflow with respect to the galactic center. Right, so the first thing you can notice in these face plots here is that the radial velocity values tend to be fairly high instantaneously everywhere. So this is just looking at a single time point. And you notice these kind of, um, you know, complex uh, varying, uh, azimuthally varying uh, uh, inflow and outflow structures, so kind of oscillating, right? And they're fairly, fairly dramatic. Um, I mean, it's, it's likely related to spiral-like structure, but it kind of complicates the view when looking at it at a single time point. So here on the bottom, we have it just averaged over a dynamical time. Um, so uh, looking at the radial velocities, again, as a function of radius, and we notice it, it does smooth everything out um, quite a bit. The general trend is, uh, you know, we see another um, difference at the disk edge, right? So gas outside the disk tends to be flowing in on average at relatively high radial velocities, uh, 10 to 20 kilometers per second. And then there's a transition at the disk edge where the flow slows down to you know, one to five kilometers per second. So just a, a, a couple of kilometers per second in the disk. Okay, so now, now we kind of want to look at, so that's the general trend of what's happening in the gas. How do the um, you know, individual mass elements of the gas, where, do, where are they actually joining the disk? So we want to try to uh, quantif quantify um, where the gas is actually hitting onto the disk. And to do this, we looked at a 
uh, selection of uh, particles that accrete between redshift 0.17 and 0.03, um, and just kind of track them, track their positions and evolution over time. Um, and we generally find that most of the gas is joining in the outer half of the disk, so between 0.5 and 1 of this radius of uh, the gaseous disk, um, with the, the peak of the distribution slightly interior to the disk edge. Right? We quantify this in a couple of ways. They, they generally agree with it. So the first way that we kind of keep as our, our fiducial way is a ge geometric argument, where we look at um, where the gas actually passes a, a, a multiple of the scale height of the gaseous disk and remains below that scale height. But we also look at it through co-rotation, so where the gas enters full co-rotational support and kind of stabilizes uh, within the disk. Okay. And finally, so if, if gas is joining in this outer half of the disk, how is it um, transporting inwards to fuel star formation? So to do this, we just looked at um, the mass flux parallel to the disk there in the blue, um, as well as the mass flux orthogonal or vertically raining down onto the, the disk in red. Um, the thick lines correspond to just um, the mass flux is smoothed in time. If you're interested in the more oscillatory structure of this, you can look at the unfiltered uh, values and the thin lines. But generally speaking, we find that the, the parallel mass flux or the radial mass flux transport through the disk tends to be more consistently dominant than the orthogonal mass flux, right? So there are, I mean, there are some ca caveats to this. It's not always that clean. For instance, like in M12i at a redshift of 0.1, you know, the orthogonal mass flux um, becomes, you know, almost co-dominant with the, with the uh, parallel mass, mass flux. But generally speaking, the dominant, dominant source of uh, transport onto the inner, inner more regions of the disk is through this parallel transport. Okay, so the final thing uh, I want to talk about is just how this compares to the star formation rates. Um, so this is just a plot showing th these radial mass fluxes measured through cylindrical shells at various radii. Um, so at 0.75 of the disk radius, 0.5 of the disk radius, and 0.25 of the disk radius, and the corresponding star formation interior to that radius. So this SF, the star formation rate sink term is just the negative uh, one, you know, negative one multiplied by the star formation rate, just so we can compare them more directly. Um, and we notice, depending on the disk you look at, they roughly align. The geometry of the disk affects this uh, to some extent. They don't perfectly match, um, mostly due to either outflows of gas, um, so it's not able to form stars, or stellar mass return. Doesn't make them, you know, perfectly balance out, but there's a rough agreement. And a general trend you see, again, is as you go in, uh, in interior radius, you get a drop off of the mass flux as this mass is being locked up in star formation or uh, blown out in uh, more central outflows. Okay. So one important thing I want to emphasize, so um, like Dushan mentioned, the, the specifics of uh, this co cosmic ray transport hasn't necessarily been nailed down and it might change in the future. Um, but we find that the, the overall qualitative picture of how this gas is flowing um, remains consistent uh, regardless of whether you're looking at cosmic ray runs, um, MHD runs, or runs without any cosmic ray physics at all, so just the hydrodynamical only runs, right? Um, so just to, just to kind of summarize what that general picture is again, we find that the, the gas in the CGM is um, coming, I think I missed a slide actually, sorry. The gas is coming down at um, small but non-zero angles, primarily radially, so coming down at about 15 degrees above um, the disk radius, um, at relatively high radial velocities, so uh, around um, 10 to 20 kilometers per second, before falling down just at the disk edge, so at slightly more vertical flows, and joining the disk, and then slowing down um, to one to five kilometers per second and radially transporting inwards in order to fuel more central star formation, right? And you can, I, there's a lot more figures in the paper doing uh, comparisons to, between hydro and MHD runs, but you can kind of uh, see that this, at least in the radial velocity, you see this transition um, near the disk edge where it's slowing down um, as it's joining the disk. Okay, I just want to 
discuss briefly the, some of the observational um, implications of this, um, right? So as I, I mentioned when I first showed this, the, the velocity structures in these disks are fairly complicated. You have these distinct regions of inflow and these distinct regions of radial outflow. Um, depending on the disk you're looking at, you know, around one to five kiloparsecs in kind of coherence size. Um, so this is, uh, you know, going to be very difficult to observe. Um, ob observing net radial transport alone has already proven very challenging. So trying to get at this structure is um, difficult. Certain, certain values of kind of coherent um, velocity, radial velocities have matched some of these instantaneous values um, we've seen. And then there's been a lot of good work uh, fitting tilted ring models to various galaxy observables to try to, try to quantify some of the um, net radial transport in the disk. Um, but this kind of brings me to uh, my final slide of the future directions we want to go with this. So I think one of the most important things we want to do with this research is make more direct observational comparisons. So we've gone ahead and made um, you know, 3D uh, data cubes out of synthetic H1 um, simu or a, uh, mock H1 observations and are trying to um, Ident try to attempt to identify some signatures of this radial transport to try to uh, help in the construction of um, models that we can use to fit observational data and kind of see if this is even a reasonable thing that might be happening um, in actual galaxies. Uh, we're additionally looking at um, angular momentum transfer, so, so specifically what's uh, torquing this gas and driving it inwards, um, both you know, importantly in the, in the galaxy itself um, where it has to lose a lot of angular momentum to be driven inwards, as well as in the CGM, where uh, the angular momentum is roughly conserved, but it is losing a slight amount as it moves inwards. Okay. So the last thing before lunch, I'll leave my conclusion slides up, and I'll take any questions. First question by Joel. So as you say, it's hard to see the dynamics, uh, but there are indirect measures. One is uh, the metallicity and the metallicity gradients. One of the things that's interesting is that the observers are really finding exactly the same thing at redshifts of one and greater, namely that the metallicity gradient is flat or even rising, rarely falling as it tends to be at low redshift. So that's going to be complicated uh, because, of course, there should be these uh, gradients uh, of gas flow coming in, some of which is presumably pristine gas with low metallicity, some of which is recycled gas with higher metallicity. But your simulations are presumably trying to follow that. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, there's now been metallicity gradients measured in something like 300 galaxies uh, at redshifts of typically between one and two. Uh, and as I say, they're finding the surprisingly flat or even rising metallicity gradient, i.e., uh, the outside is as high in metals as the inside, or even mm -hmm. higher. Uh, do your simulations look anything like that? And uh, is metallicity uh, something that might be useful as testing the model? Yes, I, I, I do think it would be. We haven't looked at that specifically, but that was kind of a motivating uh, thing for why we wanted to start looking at this in the first place. But that would be a good thing to look at. It struck me, actually, that your radial velocity is of order 10 kilometers per second. In the outskirts? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, ten, yeah. so they, on average, it's they tend to be fairly high. It's actually in quite good agreement with the tilted ring model results from Schmidt et al., right? Yeah. Uh, you're almost too modest about the comparisons. Oh, we'll have to see, but doesn't it work? It agrees quite well. Oh, yes. Right. It, I mean, it, yes, it, it matches what they're, they're yeah. finding uh, pretty well. And the other thing that struck me is that uh, H1 density profiles were very flat in your by eye. Mm -hmm. And that's also 
agrees with the observations, right? Yeah. H2 disks are exponential, H alpha disks exponential, mm -hmm. H1 disks are flat, and you see the same thing. So. Yeah, so the H1 disks yes. match very well in the interior of the galaxy. Uh, once you get to the edge, it becomes more difficult to make comparisons, or in the outskirts, it becomes more difficult to make comparisons, but that's also something that may match observations, depending on yeah. how they go. Yeah, that's very uh, convincing. Next question by Omri. Hey, two quick questions. One, um, have you distinguished between freshly accreted gas to recycled gas? I, maybe I missed. And the second question, have you looked at higher redshifts and see how this picture changes or is the same? Um, we've push, we haven't pushed it back much further in redshift. Um, I mean, the, the fire two disks tended I'd imagine they're, once they form a coherent disk, it, the picture would be similar. One uh, hint I could potentially have about that, have about that is if you have a less built-up disk, um, like M12b, um, get to the... So you notice M12b is a more compact disk. If you have a less built-up disk, I would expect it to be more quasi-spherical than coming in uh, more radially, but I, we haven't specifically looked at that. As far as recycled gas, I think um, Zach Hafen has done some good work on like tracking uh, exactly where the gas is coming from. We didn't specifically look at it uh, in this paper, but he has shown like you know fresh fresh accretion versus recycled. Um, but I don't remember the ratio off the top of my head. Okay, another question over here. Uh, thank you for such a nice talk. So you say that you will look into how the torquing exactly works mm -hmm. and uh, what drives the gas in. But I'm very interested in how, what drives the gas out. Is it just feedback and, or something else? And uh, how is it so efficient in making such a huge amount of gas being driven out in the disk plane despite all the resistance? Um, so I, I don't think we see a lot of gas actually being driven out in the disk plane. We do see those oscillations, um, okay. but they're not, they're not really outflows, right? It's the gas is just kind of sloshing back and forth um, due to some, some radial mode of oscillation probably either related to the spiral arms. We do see a lot of outflows being driven by feedback, especially as you get more to the center, um, uh, and like uh, the, especially with the cosmic ray implementation, the cosmic ray pressure support can help drive these vertical inflows um, out from the center. But yeah, we don't see the we don't really see the galaxies losing gas radially. Okay. Any final question before lunch? Of course, David. <laughs> Actually, very simple one. That is. Is there a mass dependency in the sense that the outflows and inflows depend on the mass galaxies? We observers see something that you'll call the magical mass around 10.4 in stellar mass. Mm -hmm. Is there such a, perhaps a different pattern from one side to the other side of, the, of that mass boundary? And if so, do you have an explanation for it? Um, we haven't looked at that. I would imagine there would be. I mean, because uh, at least changing the size of the gaseous disk itself does tend to have dramatic effects on some of the specifics of this. It's the same general picture, but the specifics do change. So I imagine if you go lower in stellar mass, it changes. Uh, but I, I can't, can't say anything conclusive. OK, let's thank Cameron again. Any other speakers? <laughs> we'll reconvene after lunch at 10 past 2.